Good evening, everybody. Welcome. It is Friday the 13th. I am so glad to be doing this. Um, I've been excited to do Friday the 13th, so. Hey, Cameron. Welcome. I hope you're ready for a good night. I'm ready for a good night. Tonight is going to be my lucky 13 subathon. So it is going to be, should be a really fun night. Um, oh, I just realized I don't have my glasses. Oh, I have to come here in a moment. Uh, I had to jump on actually early to get this started because uh, right on the hour, we're actually going to have uh, an interview come in. We're going to have Shannon Stoker come on. So uh, that's going to be a really fun interview. If you're looking to do some questions, definitely uh, uh, go to my about page and you'll be able to put in questions that you would want to ask. I am ready. A home after two weeks. Two weeks in the hospital. Damn, dude. Damn. I'm well. I'm definitely glad you're you're back home. If I seem a little r running around, I'm trying to get all our stuff ready to go for this interview. And I'm hoping a few more people. I have no idea how many people are jumping in. No, no, no I'm not gonna tell her that. I've got, how many people we've got? Um, but she should be jumping in relatively soon. Um, just an FYI. Oh yeah, sit back. Let's see how many subs I can actually get. Unfortunately, I did have to cap it because some stuff came up that I need to go deal with on Sunday, so. Can't do an unlimited one. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for the host. Um, I pretty much am uh, thankful for that. Um, awesome. Uh, too bad the thing doesn't count for the hosting because that would be, oh, be good. But while there's uh, someone that does like the marbles on stream that she does like giveaways for hosts, so I might have to do something at that point. So a little bit more info that I know of Shannon is that uh, her last name Stoker should sound familiar for anyone that has read any kind of fantasy horror books because uh, her ancestor is the one that inspired Dracula. For I shall come and soak your blood. Da, da. <laughs> so he is the original author of the Dracula series. So it's going to be kind of fun to really ask some questions about that. I'm really curious about it too. So. Uh, trying to write down all my notes here so so yeah if people got questions uh for uh shannon she should be on actually she should be on here any moment definitely get to my about page and that is where our info is there she is actually hello let me transition over, over. How are you tonight? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing well. Good. I was actually just had to get on early. Just to make sure all the audio stuff is six up. Good. And it's working well? Eh. I got an echo, so I kind of have to mute my uh, headphones so I don't hear myself ask you questions and then turn it back on. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I'm so, so glad, glad that you uh, put, put out, out and willing to do an interview, interview especially with a small streamer like I am. I'm just I'm so happy so to meet, to meet new, friends new friends all the time. <laughs> well, well, definitely tell us a little bit yourself. Um, I've, kind of I've kind of been highlighting uh, to, to the viewers about, about your ancestry of where you got started, but kind of what you do, what you do now, and what do you feel like sharing right now? 
Sure, of course. Um, so my name is Shanna Stoker, and I am related to Bram Stoker, who wrote Dracula. I also own my own little spooky business. I co-own it, actually, with my business partner. It's called The Ghoulish Garb, and we just celebrated our third year anniversary, which is why I'm finally comfortable enough to share with the world about my heritage. I wanted to wait until I knew that we could stand on our own two feet first, um, and it's been three years. And we're both full time with the business now. So I think it's a good time to talk about it, <laughs> which it's been a lot of fun. I've gotten the, I've got the opportunity to talk to a lot of wonderful people um, just in the past week because of coming out with this news. So that's been fun. But the Ghoulish Garb, um, we actually create unique designs based on the witchy and the macabre, all things spooky, which is just very much my personality. So it's easy to come up with material because it's what I think about all the time. (laughs) And uh, we're most known for our Terror Tarot Major Arcana deck. And we do plan to make that a full deck in a few years, but we've got some other projects in the works for in the works first. And, um, but we do sell all of our merchandise or all of our designs on different merchandise, such as phone cases and clothing and tapestries, um, lots of different things like that. So it's just been a wonderful three years of working in this business. And I'm just so grateful that it's full time now. It definitely sounds like you've had um, a wonderful experience growing the business into what it is now. I'm looking at uh, some of the stuff now on my side computer and definitely very witchy. Um, your own kind of personality in it. <laughs> Very much, and I'm glad that you. I'm glad you noticed that. It's there's a lot of me that goes into every design, and my partner too. We just we try to put our hearts and souls in every bit of it. So I hope that the people who you know purchase our stuff can feel that. Well, and I've seen a lot of the the witchy kind of elements of store bought stuff. It's kind of fake generic, it's fake. Nothing original, nothing really pizzazz. And looking at your stuff really does remind me of some of the people that I do know that do practice uh, in uh, Wiccan, that their personality just comes up and they just want to shine. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I love about witchcraft. Actual, you know, witchcraft is is that there is no box, right? We get to just kind of make it up for ourselves. It's such a personal way to express your beliefs and to um, get to know yourself. And that's what I love about witchcraft. And that's what I think comes across in our designs is that uniqueness and that kind of, you know, way of self-expression. So continuing on with the kind of the witchy things, when did you make the decision to go from like, I am a Wiccan to, I want to make this into a business to reach out into the world. Well, I'm not actually technically a Wiccan. Um, so I, so this is a kind of a, a very common um, misconception that all witches are Wiccan. So Wicca is actually a religion. And I have friends that are witches that practice who are Christian and Jewish and atheist. Um, so witchcraft doesn't necessarily belong to any religion, but Wicca usually does incorporate witchcraft. So that that's first. I'm not a Wiccan, but I am a witch. Um, but we decided it was really funny because we really just wanted, we knew first that we wanted a small business. We just didn't know what niche to go into. And my my business partner is not witchy. <laughs> um, he is, you know, he has a great appreciation and has learned so much about it because of the business. But this was ab- absolutely not his realm. Um, and so when we were discussing niches to go into for this business, I recommended this niche. And I really wasn't sure if he would go for it because again, it's not quite his thing. But after doing our research and, you know, spitballing ideas and seeing him really like his creative side really coming out with it too, um, we found out that we we wanted to go ahead and brainstorm a hundred ideas. If we could get a hundred ideas down on paper of designs that we could create within this niche, then we could go ahead and get started. And we did within like two days. I think it didn't take long at all. So um, as far as how it started, it was just really the business first. And then my personality saying, okay, I know I can, I know I can design things based on this niche. So with his approval and us working together, I mean, three years later, and we're both, like I said, full time and going just completely into it with all we have. And it's just been the, the greatest ride. Well, like I said, I could definitely see the personality in it because I, I do photography on 
my side of my side jobs. And uh, I have a few people that do kind of the witchcraft and your personality definitely shines in kind of what they do. Thank you. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Well, in full honesty, most likely I'm going to probably buy some stuff so I can give it to them because <laughs> I know they would appreciate it. Well, that is awesome. Um, let me know and I will give you a discount code since you're giving me this awesome interview. I appreciate it. <laughs> now let's kind of switch over to kind of more of the, the family history. Um, when, when did you first find out about your ancestor? Okay, so it's been known in my family for generations. They've talked about it for a long time. Um, basically, the family came from Ireland to Virginia, and then some of them split off and came down to Washington County, Alabama, which is where my family are from, um, in case you couldn't tell with my thick Southern accent. <laughs> and, right, so, um, so they knew about it for, I mean, they've known about it for a very long time. I didn't know about it personally until I was in second grade. I had just found out, okay, so I've always been interested into the odd and macabre, right? And I had um, just read somewhere about the history of the Black Plague being the actual inspiration for Ring Around the Rosie. So, of course, I was obsessed and I started writing a horror story about a little girl like myself. And I don't remember the plot, but I started writing the story and I was writing it while I was visiting my family in Auburn, Alabama. And it was my stoker, you know, the stoker side of the family. And my grandparents were like, oh, you're carrying on the family name and the family tradition. And, and I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and so that's when they told me about this. And I had already been obsessed with witches and vampires at this point. So to find out that I was related to Bram Stoker was just the coolest, coolest thing. Um, and so, but I mean, I've grown up with it now. So I didn't, <laughs> it's funny because I, I kind of like knew people would care, but had no idea how much people would care when I shared this. <laughs> Like I had 130 followers on Friday and now I've got like 58,000 or something. I, wow. I don't know. It's absolutely insane. It's been a whirlwind, but I'm so, so grateful. Um, but yeah, that's, that's when I found out was second grade. Crazy. Just how long you've known for known of it and just how much it impacts you too. It really does. And it's funny because Obviously, I feel like the spooky gene, you know, is carried within the bloodline because I was always spooky even before I knew about Brahm. But it's really beautiful to feel like I can help carry on his spooky legacy. I don't know. It's just it's it's my little small contribution to the world. <laughs> uh, so now that you've known this for growing up with the family. Did you uh, begin asking questions about kind of who he was or if there was some family stories that got kind of passed down that is uh, possibly shareable? I, I did, but unfortunately it's so far back now. And I believe we would be, I thought we were, I thought I was like his great grand niece, but I believe that I'm actually more of a cousin. So we don't really have a whole lot of like, family stories to go along with that unfortunately a lot's been lost um but you know it was just mainly his legacy that's been passed down and just kind of i mean he's just such an icon it's just incredible so i take it that you didn't hear about like any rumors about the family after he wrote the book or anything that, that <laughs> says that the family is weird and cursed and kind of has stayed through the family well we know we're weird but certainly not cursed. <laughs> if anything, okay, if anything he's given us that blessing of being oddballs and being, you know, unafraid to question the norm and to pave our own ways in the world. And I think that carrying the name Stoker really has given us that confidence to do that and the confidence to say, you know, I'm different and I'm weird and I'm strange and I think it's beautiful and I am going to find the weird and strange people out there and I'm going to tell them how beautiful they are too and just share this with the world. And I I, I wish, you know, I'm so grateful that we live in the day and age of, of social media that we can share these, you know, odd parts of ourselves and just be so, <laughs> have such a welcoming audience to do so. 
So what's one of the things that you really want to take being having him as a, an ancestor that you wanted to definitely move forward beyond just being the weird and creepy of the family? <laughs> well, it is the whole family. Um, but yes, I think, you know, I think, like I said, I just kind of, I hope that I can continue his legacy. I hope that I can share my love of the weird and strange with people. I hope that my designs, much like his story, allowed so many people to feel a new version of self-expression and a new outlet into this strange world that is under the normal, you know what I mean? I hope in the same way that my designs and that my just sheer presence on the internet can encourage other people to do the same and can keep encouraging people to carve their own way and not feel like they have to be a certain way to be a witch or a certain way to be a goth or a certain way, you know, it's, we're not meant for those types of boxes and walls and labels. And I think that's just, that's the kind of message I want to spread is just positivity, self-love, you know, and acceptance. So moving forward, what are, what some of the exciting plans that you have, not just for like your business, but also for yourself that you want to grow on uh, the name or of the brand? Well, you know, I really, I have so many interests. I'm an actress. I'm a singer. I, you know, have this business. I practice witchcraft. I am a historian. I have a good degree in a histo in history. So there's so many. I mean, there's so many things I want to do. I've talked about um, starting a YouTube channel eventually, which TikTok is helping me get. I think get there because I'm just so overwhelmed by the idea of YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> it is just so much of an undertaking, but TikTok is like the, you know, like the small version of that. So it's helping me get that underway, but I would love to start a YouTube channel um, about, I want to call it the haunted historian. And I would love to talk about history of just, I mean, anything that's spooky and witchy and macabre, of course. Um, I absolutely love history. Again, that's what my degree is in. It's, my it's one of my many passions so the idea that i could have a youtube channel you know talking about those things is exciting but most importantly i really want to focus on opening a brick and mortar store for the ghoulish garb eventually i would love to own a store in salem uh or we've talked about doing it in new orleans but salem's where my heart is so <laughs> i would very much like to own a brick and mortar store i love the community that we serve. And that is very much a mix of witches and goths and everyone in between, a lot of that overlaps. And the thing I've noticed is that these are the type of people, you know, we know what it's like to be different. We know what it's like to be outcasts and to have to figure out who we are when people are telling you to be normal. And those are always to me the kindest people because they know what it's like to feel outside and different. And so the joy of getting to speak with them every day online is amazing, but the idea of getting to do so every day in person just makes my heart flutter. I would love that. Well, I mean, you definitely can work on it where you can definitely have two different stores. You can have the main headquarters Absolutely. asylum and go for New Orleans as a second store. <laughs> Very much so. I would love that. Have you experienced any kind of uh, negative um energy or well, negative uh, feedback from coming out and begin talking with people about uh, all this? Honestly, um, after my first video, I said something in there about like, I don't want to be a gimmick. And then everybody was like, you're, well, not everybody. There was such a small handful out of the amazingly positive response that I received. There was a small handful of people that said, well, this is a gimmick. If you're, you said you don't want to talk about it and now you're talking about it. <laughs> And I was like, you know what? They have a point because I didn't express myself very well there. So I made another video yesterday. I think I put it out um, explaining what I meant by that, which was what I said before. I I wanted I when I started this business three years ago, everyone who knew about my heritage thought, oh my gosh, you have to go with that angle. You have to like, you know, make your name something having to do with that or whatever, you know. And I just. I knew I would talk about it eventually, but I really wanted to make sure that our products and my customer service and just our business as a whole could stand on its own two feet first without the help of Brom, 
You know what I mean? Because people people tend to judge you differently whenever you have those sorts of things associated to your name. And as much as I knew it would be positive, I get, again, I just, I really, I'm very, I have a lot of pride and I wanted to make sure that I was doing this of my own accord first. And like I said, it's been three years. We're both full time. We're both, you know, I mean, we've made a success of this business on our own. And so now I feel like it's time that I can share. And the response has been so overwhelmingly positive. And even especially after I explained that better in my second video, um, it's just been constant positivity. And I can't thank people enough for that. Well, that's good to hear that. It's not that bad of uh, the negative feedback. I mean, TikTok is not the best now for <laughs> Uh, keeping the bullies at bay. I mean, it, it's TikTok, <laughs> but uh, I'm glad that uh, you only had a small portion, and that seems to be all, just overwhelmed by all the positivity. It does, and you know, my strategy with negative feedback is to respond with kindness and love. And I know that's hard to do. I mean, I'm an Aries; I have a short fuse, but <laughs> <laughs> but for me, it's just to take a step and take a breath and try to respond as kindly as I can, because I found like these people don't know me. I'm just a face on a, an app that they're seeing for 15 seconds at a time. It's, it's not personal and they don't mean it personally. And if they do, they don't know me enough to be personal. So I try not to take it personally and I try to just be as kind as I can. And so far I've had great responses and I've gotten to turn uh, a couple of comments that were pretty negative into friendships and follows. So I'm I'm happy that it's working and everybody wins that way. I mean, you know, there's no downside. I love it. <laughs> I'm sitting here trying to make sure I have all my questions. I, I was running a little behind. Like I said, I had to jump on early to make sure all the audio stuff and yeah, I went a little late on getting it all done. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Take your time. I am. I'm chilling. I got my coffee, my cauldron coffee here. So, and like uh, when I message you, you're like, "Well, I don't know if I'll be open till like 10 p.m. my time." I'm like, "Yeah, that's yeah. about when I'm starting anyway." So, <laughs> I'm a night owl. It, ditto. Very much. Uh, this is when I stream. Normally, it's late at night, so it's for mm -hmm. me starting my subathon at this time was just perfect. <laughs> Uh, so far, we haven't had any questions from the viewers yet. Uh, I'm still keeping an eye out for that poll. Sounds good. I'm here. I'm chilling. Like I said, we got time. So what's going to be uh, your next step from here? Now that you got you got the TikTok, uh, you got a lot of people definitely reaching out uh, with the positivity. I was doing like, the interview. What seriously is like the next step that you see yourself doing? Honestly, I have, th okay, I thought that TikTok, I thought this was going to be a long journey, okay? I expected eventually to gain traction because of, you know, the Stoker thing or just simply because of our business. Um, I had no idea. I mean, I truly could not have foreseen that it would blow up the way it has in just one week. And so right now I'm just kind of focusing on trying to get our name out there and um, doing interviews like this and talking to people. And, um, oh, I've just been invited to be a guest or the, the guest um, at the Southeastern Witches Ball on October 23rd. And the oh, cool. theme is the vampire's lair. So like, I am geeking out totally. <laughs> I'm just like, they asked me and I'm, I just feel I'm so honored and humbled and absolutely going to be there dressed to the nines with fangs to match. I cannot wait. So that's what I'm doing in October. <laughs> that sounds um, awesome. I mean, if I could, I would invite try to have the whole con here in Colorado, try to get you out one of these years. Absolutely. I love cons. So I usually go to Dragon Con every year. Of course, I didn't get to go last year and I didn't get to make it in 2019 either, just because I was, I was in a performance. Um, there's like a hair in there. It is. Okay. My cat hair. <laughs> oh, I've got two cats and their hair is always in my eyes. Anyway. Um, 
I, ha- I was in a, a stage performance at the time, so I couldn't go in 2019 and I'm just missing it terribly. But I love, love going to cons. And that is so very much, again, what I mentioned before about how I love misfits and I love talking with people who know what it's like to be different and outcasts. And cons are the best place to meet those people. <laughs> yes, it is. I love it. I love it. I'm actually doing the Carl Springs Comic Con that's in two weeks. I'll have my own booth while I do my photography. That's really cool. Are you going to be like um, setting up like with backgrounds and stuff for people? I actually have a model that's going to help me out to try, obviously, drag people into the booth. But she'll be dressed up, and we've got a backdrop ready for her. We're going to do a, a beach scene and have her dress up as Misty from Pokemon. Oh, very cool. That'll be awesome. I love that. Oh, I usually yeah. am dressed as uh, as Belle, <laughs> as Princess Belle. <laughs> I used to There's do, something wrong with I, that. No, I. it's just so funny because I'm so spooky, but I love Disney princesses. <laughs> I used to own my first small business actually in college that helped me pay my way through college was um, a character performance company. So I used to perform at children's birthday parties. And then now my business is spooky and witchy so it's really different but they're both still very much a part of my personality <laughs> have you thought about trying to do like that pris- uh, princesses turning into witches and that kind of the different outfits yes i just my friend my roommate actually just sent me those last night and i haven't seen them in like a year and a half i was just thinking i've got to do that bell outfit but um, I'm really, oh man, I have so many different cosplay ideas. I just don't have the time to do them right now. And I'm, I always have to commission my stuff because I, I can do wigs, but I cannot make dresses. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot make dresses. And honestly, I mean, if we're honest with myself, if I'm honest with myself, my wig work is subpar. So I usually like to commission those too. Um, but yeah, I, I miss cosplay. I miss cons. I miss the people and the crowds. Oh, can't wait to get back into them. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to the Comic-Con, and we're going to go to the Horicon uh, next month. Good. That'll be fun. There's Megacon happening right now in Orlando that I wish I could go to. And then I think in or- uh, in Orlando in October, there's um, Spooky Empire. And again, I'm going to miss all of these right now, which stinks. But hopefully next year I can get my ducks in a row in time to make it. <laughs> and maybe have a booth. I would love to have a booth. Well, I mean... Before long, you're just going to be invited in as a guest. So you might just uh, keep up <laughs> pushing all these videos and just uh, go in as a guest. I would, again, just be so immensely honored to be invited. I mean, I, I just, oh, I was just recently asked to, um, there's a con in Dublin that I was, I was asked to video in as a guest for that con and I'm and talk about my history and, and my business and all of that. I'm just, it's so surreal. I just I had no idea this was going to come. And especially so quickly, I just don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> so it kind of sounds like you almost have to use your historian uh, background to begin digging back into the family so that you and can have are. new family history. We are. That's actually what we're working on. My uncle right now, my uncle who got me into witchcraft, he is on the Stoker side. And he's actually, his name is Brandon, but they named him because of Brom. Um, So he is doing a lot of, we've actually been doing a lot of research together. But my cousin Susan, who was named after, I can't remember who it was, but somebody around the same time that Brom was living. um, She did a bunch of research and she went over to Ireland and did more research. She's been able to trace us all the way back to Dublin where that Brom was living and, or that he was born rather. And um, the farthest back that we've found is a woman by Anne Stoker and she lived in Lancashire, Ireland, or England, I'm sorry. Um, So, and that was in, she was born in, 15, no, 1670, I think. So that's the the farthest back we found. But yeah, we've still got to figure out how it all links together exactly. <laughs> well, I, I got to do some family history because my, my last name is tied to a whole family that was the ones able to read and write. So our names are on almost every document, courts, births, deaths, everything, wow. because we can are uh, the ones that were able to read and write. That's amazing. So I bet you have a lot of like written actual documentation of that. Well, I don't, uh, but I need to go get those documents. <laughs> but I'm sure you could find it. Yeah. 
yeah, I just have to kind of grab it from my family. But yeah, we've been founded that all the way back that we were just one of the families that was able to read and write. And so we just got dragged into all sorts of documents. <laughs> they had you notarizing everything. Just <laughs> Oh, you know how to write? Great. Right. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. What's one thing that you definitely want to hope to find during the family research? You know, that's a good question. I guess I haven't really looked at it and thought of what I hope to find. I try not to go into these things with those types of expectations because, you know, you don't want to be disappointed. And in my experience with, you know, research and, and old documents and letters and things like that, for me, it's the mundane that is the most fascinating. It's the day to day. I would love, I guess I would love to find some letters of his or, you know, from, from the family about him. Um, because that's been my favorite in my work with historical research. The letters are my favorite documents to read because it's, it's, I love listening or reading just about updating the family on what, going on you know who's sick or who had a baby or is the mule down today or I mean there's just it's the mundane to me that fascinates me in history because it's so cool for me to think of if I were living back then these are the types of things that would matter to me on the day-to-day -day. these are the types of things that would consume my life every day and it's just so incredible to think about it and to to put it into that perspective and I would just really love to get that perspective about him with your uh, research with a historian, is there anything that you found that was unique, uh, definitely odd to find? Goodness. Okay, so it's been a while since I've done like historical research, uh, as far as like for my school studies. <sighs> Let's think. There's so many odd and wonderful things. Oh, I was just reading recently about. Oh man, I wish I could remember her name. No, that's not good because I won't remember anything. Okay, so I, I'm going to just preface this with the fact that I have severe ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the symptoms of ADHD happens to be the complete blanking whenever I get asked specific questions that I know the answer to. I could talk about this all day. I'd probably write a paper on it, but right now, gone. Gone. <laughs> I will tell you, I used to be extremely obsessed with the Salem witch trials. So, of course, I mean, again, I, I've always been really interested in this type of thing. And I found a book about them at the Scholastic Book Fair uh, when I was in, like, fourth grade. And so I started, like, consuming any type of media I could about the Salem witch trials. Um, and I wrote so many papers in, like, middle school on <laughs> the Salem witch trials. And I've read so many books. So um, I don't know. I'm just, I, I, I mean, there's really not much more to tell than's already been told about that, but that's definitely one of the points in history I, I really love learning about. But my historical research in college was mainly focused on post-Civil War. Um, and I really, in the same way that I was telling you that I prefer looking at the mundane when it comes to historical documents, I, I really prefer in my historical research talking about or looking at the grassroots movement and people or movements and people on the on our level making change so the civil rights movement feminism the first and second and third waves of it um different ways that like child labor laws were changed because of riots and i mean i love that type of history and so that's why why i really focused on post civil war style stuff so that's where most of my research comes in so and i give respect to you historians because there's so much documents that uh some of the old cursive writing that, yeah, I'm good at reading cursive, but some of that stuff, boy, I don't know how the hell you make your heads or tails on those handwritings. Well, and the thing about it is, it's, it, it's, I think you're talking specifically about like Palmer script, which was the, the way of writing back then. And, you know, people complain all the time now about um, penmanship. It's not taught in schools anymore, right? Well, the reason it's not taught in schools anymore is because we don't really need it. Everything is done on computers. The reason that they used to have, you know, Palmer script or different types of like taught ways of writing like that is because it needed to be standardized. You had to be able to read their writing. And so that's why, you know, in that script, like 
S's look like F's and um, there's so many different weird little things like that, but it was, it, it's hard at first. And then it's just like, you can just, you read it just like anything else after a while, it gets, it becomes second nature, but you do have to learn it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could write like that after I've studied it for so long. You, you think you'd be able to, but I still can't. No, because that's, that's totally a different skill as uh, from a totally it to different... writing it. <laughs> It is, and it takes a lot of time to to master the Palmer script. Yeah. Plus, you need to get a fountain pen and get used to writing a fountain pen, and that alone yes. takes a little bit of skill. <laughs> yes, and a lot of times, well, and that's another thing is like the way that we were writing. I mean, why does cursive in the nineteen or in the twentieth century look so different from the nineteenth century? Because pens were faster, so you didn't, you weren't taking as long to write each individual letter, so it became less and less, you know, standardized and less and less um uh ornate in the style and i just again i'm sorry this is not what you were going on about but i, I love talking <laughs> about this stuff so much i could just uh love it uh, i i can understand i mean one thing i do with my photography is volunteer to go find gravestones and take photos of those who requested for genealogy historical or just because they're curious of who the uh, stone was that's wonderful i love cemeteries I real I mean not oh, just I, because they're spooky, but I think they're so from the historical aspect, it's they're so fascinating. There's so much information to be found from a headstone alone. Oh, absolutely. I've got a book called Stories in Stone that talks about a lot of symbologies and abbreviations and, and after we've grabbed that book, uh, walking through a cemetery, you can almost see the different chapters and stories that you can read. Yes. Yes. And you can see families and you can see I mean, it's just absolutely, you're so right. You're so right. And I just, I find them so beautiful and so peaceful. And there's so much energy in the cemetery. You know, there just really is. I've only had one issue one time doing a shoot for uh, someone. And I got a name and I got a plot. And I got good reading where the beast plots are. Except I just had the section of the cemetery. And that's it. I didn't understand everything else. And so when we went to look it up, they actually had to bring the old book, the original book oh. that they actually wrote the name in. And it turns out the section was a mass burial due to TB. And they oh just had gosh. six, 700 people, at least two thirds were children and no names, nothing at all, nothing even in the grass. It was completely just an open area. Wow. You know, that reminds me a lot of actually of Salem. There is an area, I think it's behind a CVS now, where there were um, hangings and mass graves and there's not even a marker. I mean, it's just from historical documents that they have found it. And I mean, yeah, so many people. It's just, it's crazy to think of how many different plots of land carry those types of graves. Oh, and this one, uh, this cemetery is up in Denver, Colorado, and it's one of the older ones because the oldest was Cheeseman Park, and they actually dug up those to move them so the city can expand, and the whole backstory of Cheeseman Park alone is uh, crazy because of robbers, uh, people who want to make money, and the leftover yeah, bones. Yeah, grave robbers, um, yeah. But... Um, the fact that this cemetery really did a lot of development, a lot of above ground stuff, and the fact that this one section is nothing but a huge mass grave. It's the only one I've ever had an issue on. Wow. That is, that's crazy. And I bet being there and just being in the presence of that was powerful. Well, and I've been there 30, 40 times before doing other photos and walking everywhere else. So I've been by this section. I just, this is the first time I found out that this section was just this mass burial. And it was kind of heartbreaking because I do, I do three photos. I do a nice shot of the stone and then I back up so you can kind of see a mark or two and then give you a good wide view. And all I could do is just this shot of the field and go, I have mm. nothing to share except this field. Gosh, that is heartbreaking. Mm. But in the how same, the, how, I'm sorry. I was going to say in the same cemetery, I, I did another request that I got an actual personal email from the family, and it turns out that he was a lost relative 
uh, in the family tree, and they didn't know what happened to him. And it turns out he actually got run over uh, by a vehicle in Denver and got buried out there because no one knew who he was. No one had any information. And so they just had his name, and that's it. Wow. And were, I mean, did you help them find him? Yeah, I had the, the request wow. for it. So I took a photo, and then they dropped me an email going, I can't believe you found, found someone from my family. That's amazing. And see, that's so, what a beautiful way to help people. And I'm sure that's got to give a lot of people some closure. I mean, that's beautiful. Yeah, you you would think. And then a totally different cemetery. I had someone ask about what I was doing, explained uh, what I did. And they're like, that's a little private. You really shouldn't be doing that. We should, and you know, I have people do that and want to take them off. I'm like, okay, we're just trying to help remember your family. Well, and you're doing it by request, right? I mean, it's yeah. not like, yeah, so you're helping people. Well, and that's the thing is just because it's private to one person. I mean, think about culturally the fact that there are still plenty. Look at us in Victoria in Victorian time. We would take pictures of our loved ones in their caskets because that was the last viewing we were ever going to have of them. And usually they didn't have a lot of photos of them alive anyway. And so that's still a common practice in many different places in the world. Whereas today in Western society, it seemed, it seems so gauche, right? It, it's something like you wouldn't take your picture of your grandfather in his casket. <laughs> but I mean, honestly, I think it's a beautiful way to reserve, to, to preserve that memory of the last time you see them. And it's really interesting to just talk about culturally. And as far as even from family to family, how those types of things can be so, so vastly different. Well, and that happened. The change with that is they came out with uh, the Better Living catalog and they changed the room where the viewing used to be. They said that, you know, this needs to be more livened up and changed to this more <laughs> living space, to this living room. Mm. I don't know what it is about our obsession uh, in Western culture to, you know, preserve, like to, to, to just not look at death in the face. Um, I mean, thinking even of just embalming, like just why, why are we so desperate to try to mask what death actually is, you know? And that's one of the reasons I love the macabre so much. I'm, I'm fascinated by death. I've had near death. Well, I guess I've technically been dead for 11 minutes and I had a really bad car accident. And so I've always been fascinated by death and I've, I've dealt with death from such a young from a very young age um but then having that personal connection with it even more i'm just absolutely it, i don't i just will never understand why people feel the need to to try to mask death it's a part of life it's the yin to the yang you know i mean it's just a natural part of the cycle and i think we need to honor it instead of hiding it away one of the viewers was commonly saying that humans are unable to face death as a reality most of the time. Well, I, I, can you give me more information on that? I'd love to talk with you about that or, or, or hear why you have a hard time with that. And the thing is, I understand ultimately and intellectual, intellectually, I do understand why people have a hard time facing death and their own mortality or the mortality of the ones that they love. But I think, I think by facing it head on and looking at the beauty of death is a way to find peace in it. And ultimately, that's what we want, right? We want to find peace, peace with our loved ones passing on, peace with our own mortality. And it's not something we can change anyway. I think that's ultimately my thought on it is like there's nothing I can do to change this it is inevitable there is no cure coming in my lifetime or maybe any lifetime that will keep us from death so I want to have a good relationship with it and you know with the advancements of them trying to take our brains into more the cyber world where we can live beyond this body into the cyber world that's also a weird yes. way of looking at the death yeah because i mean well and it really depends on what you believe is you know is just our our soul is that all we need to preserve in order to you know is it just this this brain in my head that we need to preserve or is it is there something more 
you know, and, and if they weren't able to eventually transplant my head into a vat of liquid and then hook that thing up to some way, some computer, so my, my, my brain and my memories could have a new voice, would it just be like a hard drive of my brain and memories that somebody could pick like files in a computer or would my consciousness be there? Would my essence of who I am be there as well? And I think that's, that's, you know, that's something philosophers have been talking about for forever. I mean, <laughs> we can talk about that all day long and we'll never know the answer. I think that's a dangerous thing. If, especially if with my mind being able to connect to the rest of the world, I'm I'm a Gemini with ADHD. I've got four different <laughs> minds, two of them arguing, and the third one's going, "Why am I here?" Yes, I'm a Gemini moon, so I feel you. Ah. <laughs> I love it. I'm glad. Okay. So we both have ADHD. It was so funny that you said that because I just saw a TikTok that was like me when I'm talking to neurotypicals. Yeah. Oh, I love what you've done with this space. It looks so nice in here. Me talking to a neurodivergent. Yeah. So what really happens whenever you talk about the existence of man is like, <laughs> and I was, just, I was just thinking like, you've got to be a neurodivergent because I am, I'm clicking very much in my ADHD with you. So <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, I got diagnosed a long time ago of ADHD back when it was still like ADD and then ADHD. Mm. And then I also got ADHLAS. Okay, so I didn't get um, diagnosed until, let me think how old I am now. I'm 28. I got diagnosed two years ago when I was 26. And it was actually because of the accident that I was in that I mentioned before that I like started realizing my symptoms because I was, I was, dealing so much with my mental health at the time that I was like, oh, wait, these are all symptoms. And I wish so much that I had known about it at a younger age. But girls don't typically get diagnosed at a young age anyway, just because of our symptoms being so very different usually. Um, so, but yeah, it's definitely a new thing for me. So I'm still very, <laughs> I'm still like consuming any type of media I can to tell me about myself. I love it. No, I got diagnosed when I was uh, one. And uh, wow. but yeah, first time I, I got put on. Diagnosed that that young. Well, back this is way back when when you know ADHD was part of this big span of everything else, mental health. So, mm -hmm. um, but my mom did recognize that there was something different. Actually, you could look through my eyes when I was under the age of one, and it looks like I wasn't here. I I, I was responding, wow. but I yeah. I wasn't home. And so we, mm -hmm. uh, she pushed to get me on some medication. And the first time I got on Ritalin, I think I was like one and a half, two, something like that. I end up sitting down and petting the cat for two hours. And we know it's two hours because <laughs> oh my, my mom gosh. watched it. And she was shocked that I was petting the cat, not chasing the cat. And we, the cat stayed for two hours because it was shocked I wasn't chasing it. <laughs> just happy for the reprieve of the chaos <laughs> no it was waiting for the chaos and going why is this just simple petting <laughs> well that that is some intense uh reaction right there that's a very intense reaction to the ritalin yeah i am definitely a fey uh, receptacle to the ritalin now so although i'm much higher doses now in my adult life but yeah I, mm -hmm. i'm still very much reactive to it well that's awesome that's great i'm so glad to meet another you know neurodivergent woo woo let's start a club <laughs> i'm pretty sure tiktok is a club of neurodivergent <laughs> you have to just go oh look a video oh look a video oh look a yes, video seriously oh my gosh that is when i first got on tiktok so i'm very new to tiktok and i didn't even get an account until just a few months ago and then i i made my first video of like I've been making them very slowly and sporadically until this past week. And um, so, but that was why I wouldn't get on it because I was so addicted to it. I was just like, <laughs> this is an ADHD or like dream and nightmare because I cannot stop. I can't stop. <laughs> it's just, they're so short. They keep me engaged for just as long as my attention span can hold. And that's what the new three minute ones. I can't, I can't, I can't. <laughs> they're too long. Even when they're interesting, I'm like, Skip through, skip through, skip through. <laughs> I it's so bad. I'm I'm awful. <laughs> yeah, I know that feeling perfectly well. I, the, my favorite one so far is I'm off to go do a new hobby because I'm following the opening. <laughs> yes, I just that was just on my for you page like two days ago, and I'm like, this is my life. I sent it to my roommate because 
So my roommate is my best friend of over a decade and we've we've never lived together until this past year. We we've only been living together for it'll be a year in November. And um so they've been a part of my ADHD journey like online because we weren't living in the same area for a while, but I was telling them like oh my gosh, I'm just I understand why I am the way I am and like everything makes sense now. And so I've been sharing this whole journey with them, right? Well, um, basically it was so funny because just after a few weeks of living together, they were like, Shanna, I had no idea just how much ADHD it affects like every little thing in your life. And I was like, yeah, they were like, I mean, you tried to explain it, but I had no idea. And it wasn't until they could see me every day and see how I've like had to find outside of the box ways to <laughs> deal with like every little thing or else I'll forget or I'll lose my focus or I'll hyper fixate too long. And it's just so funny that they, to see them witness it and realize just how much it can, it really affects you. It's not fun. It's not quirky. It is not cute. It sucks. <laughs> It's, Have you seen, I mean, we joke about it, but it sucks. Oh, yeah. Have you seen the uh, teenager that does a really good job explaining the, the ADHD and all his just vi different videos of showing different times with ADHD? I think, does he have... He usually like, does it in his room. Curly brown hair. Yeah, in his room, and he's got kind of curly brown hair. Because I just found somebody like that. That sounds, um, I, for some reason, I, I got his face as soon as you said that so he was talking about i just sent it to my friend let me look him up yeah that's what i'm doing too because <laughs> i literally if it's who i'm thinking of i just sent them my my best friend that i was telling you about i just sent them one of his videos here it is um come on now open up it's uh cody wolf or quarter and wolf no, this is Nick Fight. Now, this is who I'm talking about. Oh, yes, him. Yeah, this is who I was talking about. Ah, okay. Yeah, but him, yes. I've been following him since I got on to <laughs> TikTok because the first thing I looked up was ADHD stuff. Well, the first things people were sending me was ADHD <laughs> stuff. Because, again all i talk about now yeah. <laughs> Just um but yeah yeah his stuff is so accurate it is ridiculous so accurate so he talks about it. how they need to rename adhd because it doesn't really fit everything and they're going yeah. through everything and well backstory my first name is david mm. nickname dave so they did the diversity um version and changed the name from ADHD to Dave. <laughs> Is that what they did? <laughs> so it's just you're the poster child I, for it. I'm the poster child of ADHD. <laughs> That's a good claim to fame. I like it. I'm a little well, jealous. Well, then, then there's the video of um, um, the audio. It's like, God damn it, Dave. That they begin playing <laughs> after all this now. I have not seen the Dave thing, but that's definitely going to be, I'm going to have to look it up now. <laughs> or maybe you can send me some videos. <laughs> I'll have to find it. Yeah, please do. <laughs> Damn it, Dave. Damn it, Dave. I, I like that. I like it. And, you know, it's always good to give it a name. Well, our viewer did ask a question, but uh, it's definitely not a witch thing. It's actually about ADHD. And, cool, let's uh, do it. So he's not 100% sure and never been diagnosed as um, possible traits of someone with it recommend getting tested or not. Oh, absolutely. I got tested. Again, I didn't get diagnosed till I was 26. And that was, I went to my GP, my general practice, or, um, you know, my doctor, my regular doctor. And I said, hey, I have all of these symptoms. I think I have ADHD. And she um, recommended me to a very well-known in the city um, psychiatrist who has all of that information. I went there, I took a test, it wasn't very long, and then I did a psych evaluation with the psychiatrist um, because it, it seemed like I was very close, like it could have been ADHD and it could have been BPD, 
um, which is like bipolar personality or, you know, bi bipolar personality disorder. Um, and so we talked about, you know, he asked me a lot of by, about my symptoms to see which way I was leaning. And I leaned ADHD, not BPD. And so um, through that psych evaluation is how they were able, and, and the test is how they were able to, to diagnose me. So I highly recommend to anyone that feels like you're watching these TikToks and you're seeing these memes and it feels like really spot on go talk to a psychiatrist, you know, talk to your GP if you're not sure where to go and they'll give you a good recommendation um, and get tested. I mean, what can, what can it hurt? It's always better to know. And it has completely changed my life for the better to give it a name, to be able to intellectualize my symptoms and say, okay, I'm not lazy. I'm just having a day to day where this is it's harder for me to focus or I'm hyper focusing right now and I need to remember to to set alarm so I'll eat. You know, like things like that. I mean, it's just it gives you so much more power over your symptoms whenever you can give it a name and look it in the face and, you know, intellect. Like I said, it's just oh, it takes your power back. Definitely, definitely get tested. See, I've been diagnosed since, like I said, back when I was one. So I've always known that I've had this in my mind. And the big thing I recommend people now is if you're going to go to get diagnosed and they do do a test, don't care about the results. Because the, a lot of issues now is that they're finding adults that want to get diagnosed and want to make sure that they actually have it are so focused on this test to get it done that they don't have it because they're so focused on the result. Whereas when kids and teenagers do, they're getting dragged by the parents to come get this test done. And they're like, I don't want to be here. So they goof off on the test and lo and behold, they have it. So if you're exactly. going to get tested, don't care what the result says. Just do the test very casually and that will tell you more what you might naturally be. And that's why I think it's so important also to find a psychiatrist that is going to do the psych evaluation with the test, because even, excuse me, <clears throat> even though, you know, I very much wanted to be, or wanted to find out, like I was so interested and so um, invested in what this test was going to tell me. And I was, I was very hopeful that it did say ADHD because I wanted answers and that's the only thing that made sense. So but even then, I still had trouble focusing on that test <laughs> because it is severe, Dave. When I tell you it's severe, I mean it. But I definitely think that whenever you are looking for a psychiatrist um, as an adult to try to get this you know, tested, that you want to make sure that they're also going to do an evaluation one-on-one, -on -one, ask you about your symptoms. And when they're asking you about your symptoms, it's also so important. And this is with any doctor, with anything that you're going through. I also have um, endometriosis, which is um, a disease having to do with female anatomy, like with or with biologically female anatomy. And um, so it has to do with like my uterus and it's a lot of pain. And I have learned you have to be your own best advocate, which means when the doctors ask you about your symptoms, regardless of what it is, tell them about your worst day, not how you're doing today. Because today you're motivated, you're in the doctor's office. Mm -hmm. Tell them about your worst day. Write down your symptoms on your worst day because a lot of times we tend to forget how bad it can be. So when they're asking you in the psych, psych evaluation, for example, about your symptoms, have a list ready. Tell them about your worst day. Tell them when you're how it is when you're hyper focusing. Tell them how it is when you cannot focus on anything, you know, and, and just try to go ahead and get that list written in your phone or your notes or something now so that when they ask you, the ADHD kicks in, like we said, and you're blanking on everything, you've got it written down and, and you've already got it ready to show. And especially if anyone mentions anything that is somewhat relating, like, oh, you are doing X, Y, Z or whatever. If someone's mentioning it to you, write it down. Um, yeah. Because that way, that way you can give them saying, hey, this is someone else's point of view. Uh, I, my wife, I've told her that I want her to come in for an appointment so that she can give her two cents so that we can begin getting an outside view so that we can make sure my treatment's right on track. Absolutely. And I think that's important to have somebody who is neurotypical because as neurodivergence, yes, we understand our symptoms from our point of view, but we don't necessarily know everything that is 
supposed to be typical and how we differ. And so I do, I think, I think that you're right. Having that perspective from somebody in your life, um, separate from you who can, who can look at this list and say, oh yeah, this, 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 and this, and here are examples is a really uh, great way to also help advocate for yourself. Well, I definitely have to admit, this was definitely not the direction at all. I thought we would we end up talking about, I thought, you know, what we're talking about is like the Dracula, stupid vampire stuff. Like, do you really like Twilight? That, I mean, that's the stuff I expected to go. I know, but the, you know, you never can plan these things, right? <laughs> but what, I mean, come on, we we'll both have the ADHD. We just go this way. Nope, this way. We just go wherever our minds take us. <laughs> Damn it, Dave. <laughs> Damn it, Dave. <laughs> and that's all you can think about for the rest of the time. Damn it. That's Dave. it. <laughs> that's gonna be, I'm just going to be like every moment now that I'm hyper fixating or that I can't focus and I realize I'm just going to be, Damn it, Dave. <laughs> and I can see it now. I'm just going to open up my phone. There's a message. What's this message? Damn it, Dave. Oh, dude. I, I was just thinking I'm going to have to message you personally. And just blame you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's definitely right near that. We've got like a couple more minutes left on the interview. Uh, if there's anyone else that wants to definitely shoot off a message, you can shoot it in chat or in the suggestions box while uh, we're kind of wrapping things up. Thank you so much for definitely joining me on this stream. Definitely a good way to start off this subathon. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a pleasure. I love, like I said, meeting new friends. So I really appreciate you having me on. And uh, the viewer definitely appreciates the advice on the ADHD. Good. I'm glad it helped. So uh, definitely, we'll be in touch, definitely, because I think it'd just be fun to continue to see the excitement of everything and uh, definitely of the your store and where you're going to go with it. Thank you. I would love that. And please, yeah, get in touch with me because I'd love to give you a personalized coupon code because I've just had a great time talking with you and I want to make sure that you can find something that you love from our store. Oh, I know. I have saw several things that I like and I know I have several that I need to get for friends because it just totally fits their personality. <laughs> Good. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, ooh, we do got one question. What is the most random question that you have gotten about your ancestor? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people have just been asking if he was a real vampire <laughs> or if he was the real Van Helsing. And this is all actually about his time as a vampire hunter. So... <laughs> There have been a lot of, uh, because of that, there's also now been accusations that I am a real vampire. <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> I'd say that's probably the oddest comment I've gotten, but also very flattering. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely my favorite so far. <laughs> and I'm hoping you don't want to twinkle that, that much I'm hoping for. No, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to leave the twinkling to twilight and uh, I, I'm just going to stay in my coffin, you know, <laughs> and much more, much more what we do in the shadows than twilight. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> well, that looks like the only question. So thank you so much for joining me again. I, I'm definitely looking forward to staying in touch and uh, who knows, we'll definitely may have to set up another time to do another interview. I would love that. Thank you so much. And thank you to the viewers and your questions. And I hope I could answer them well enough and help you if I can. <laughs> if nothing else, it was definitely a fun interview uh, to do going from vampires to ADHD. <laughs> well, you know, that's just who we are. <laughs> <laughs> Very much who I am, at least, Dave. <laughs> All right. Well, have a great night. I'm going to transition back onto my Just Chat page and um, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Have a good night. Same to Bye. you.